Welcome to the Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. We hope you all participate in our conversation. You can chat with us in the chat box beside the video, and I'd like to invite you, in fact, to use the chat box to say hello and let us know where you are from. Before we begin, let's begin with prayer. Father God, once again, we thank you that you are sovereign. You are Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And um, even though we live in a broken world in which things like Ebola and loss of fever um, erupt and wreak havoc, we know that you are a compassionate and gracious God. We give you this time today and thank you for everyone listening in. And be with Megan as she presents in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so I'd like to introduce our, our speaker. speaker. Megan Vidic works with Samaritan's Purse as a global technical advisor for international medical programs based here in Boone, North Carolina. She started her career as a nurse in Washington, D.C. and upon completing a master's of public health degree at Johns Hopkins University, transitioned into emergency medical program implementation and management. Megan has worked in several different countries, focusing on health updates such as Ebola, Zika, cholera, and diphtheria. In 2017, Megan worked and lived at Samaritan's Purse Emergency Field Hospital in Mosul, Iraq, where she was the program manager for the last several months of the program. Today, Megan will present viral hemorrhagic fever overview, theory, and practical application. Megan? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending today. Uh, so today we will be going over viral hemorrhagic fevers, um, both theory and practical application. All right, our objectives for today will be to gain familiarity with viral hemorrhagic fevers. Um, I'll be using BHF uh, to refer to these, as well as to learn the basic principles for protecting yourself as a healthcare provider or disaster responder from BHF. Um, important for today, I want to stress that this is not just for healthcare providers or for clinicians. It's really for anyone who's going to be responding um, to a disaster that would Im involve a viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, and some of these principles are applicable to many different epidemics as well. Um, so the topics we'll review today are again, viral hemorrhagic fevers, an overview. Um, we'll go through some specific DHF diseases, including Ebola and loss of fever. We'll also go through a practical review, looking at personal protective equipment, or PPE, and if we have time, getting to treatment centers. Um, so just a little bit of my background so you know why I can talk to this subject. Um, as Cindy mentioned, I have worked with Ebola. Um, I responded to the 2014 um, epidemic. Um, I went to Liberia. I was not actually working with Samaritan's Purse, but got to know Samaritan's Purse through that time. Um, and so I stayed, uh, worked as a nurse with Ebola patients and then actually stayed for another year and ran for about six months um, a USAID funded training program where we trained both expat and national staff on how to be safe um, and take care of uh, patients within an Ebola treatment center. Um, so this is about a six day training that I did um, for the, over that six months, um, you know, every week. And I've tried to boil it down into about an hour. So bear with me. Um, this is just a tease for what we here um, at Samaritan's First Headquarters hope to eventually offer, which would be um, a more in-depth and focused training for epidemic response that eventually we would want to roll out for some of our DART members. So stay tuned for that, um, but let's move forward. Okay, so I really wanted to start here today. Um, I think it's very important as Christians, obviously, to ground ourselves in the, in the word. Um, but in particular, when we're talking about preparedness um, and epidemic response, I personally uh, feel a great responsibility to make sure that we are good stewards of what we have, um, that we, you know, the knowledge that we have, that we're not putting it under a bushel or under a basket, but in fact, that we are putting it out there for the world to see. Um, you know, obviously, this particular verse um, is speaking to the gospel and the fact that we want our light to shine. Um, but from my standpoint as uh, a technical health advisor, the way I do that every day is um, by helping our staff be prepared, by helping our organization be prepared to respond um, and to do quality work when we do respond. Um, so 
with that in mind, um, I, I'm praying that this lecture will give all the glory to our Father who is in heaven. Okay, so a quick overview of some of the main viral hemorrhagic fevers that are known. Um, there are probably a little bit more than 10 in total. If you go to the CDC website, you'll see more mentioned. Um, but these are the main sticks that the WHO reviews on their website. Um, there'll be a resource list that's provided later. Um, so what is VHF? Uh, it is a general term for several viruses that can lead to hemorrhagic symptoms, otherwise known as uncontrolled bleeding. Um, they don't always lead to uncontrolled bleeding, but in fact, they can. So today, we will focus primarily on loss of fever and Ebola, as these are the two that you'll be most likely to encounter if you're in a disaster situation or in the field. Um, they also have the highest likelihood of spreading if they're not contained um, and require the highest level of personal protection or attention to guidelines. Um, so we'll be using those as uh, kind of our guide for what you need to know the most, uh, but we'll go through some others just so you're familiar. Um, so starting off, uh, we're going to look at Korean Congo hemorrhagic fever, or CCHF. This is a tick-borne disease. It can also be transmitted through infected animal fluids. It's endemic to Africa, the Balkans, the Middle East, and Asia, as well as a few other southern countries. Then we have dengue. Um, many of you, if you've worked abroad, or are familiar with dengue. Um, more of a severe form of it, though, can turn into a hemorrhagic fever. Dengue itself is mosquito-borne, so transmitted by mosquitoes, um, and it's well known throughout the tropical and subtropical cities of the world. Um, severe dengue is generally seen in Asian and Latin American countries. Um, again, the resources will be provided later, but I, I got all of this information from the WHO website. If you just Google viral hemorrhagic fevers, uh, they have a great overview uh, for those in particular. Um, and there's also an open source WHO uh, training center that's online. Um, and I actually just today got an email that there is a training for CCHF as well as loss of fever. So if you want to learn more about these in particular, you can visit there. Um, moving on, we have Ebola virus disease or EBD. Um, you, this is transmitted through infected animal fluids. The bat or a bats of many kinds are known to be reservoirs for this virus. There are potentially other animals as well. Um, but the bat is the one that we've seen most of so far. Um, generally, an outbreak does start with an individual be, being infected by some type of um, virulent animal fluid, and then from there, it turns quickly into human-to-human -human transmission, and that's when an outbreak really starts to expand. Um, and this is generally seen in Central and West Africa. Then we have loss of fever. We have loss of fever, which is uh, endemic to most of West Africa. Um, we see it in countries such as Benin, Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, Mali, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and Togo. Um, so pretty much the entire West African hemisphere. Um, it is transmitted by rodent and urine feces. Not, uh, not super fun, but um, essentially what happens is either individuals, or sorry, either uh, the rodents will pass over the food that's been left open or the feces will be dry and be particulate in the air. Um, it's passed on originally that way. It can also be passed through human to human transmission, although not quite as much as in Ebola virus disease. Um, then we have Marburg virus disease, which is similar to Ebola. Um, it also is transmitted through infectable infected animal fluids, uh, as well as human-to-human -human transmission. Marburg is seen primarily in Central Africa and countries including Kenya and Uganda. And last week, we have Rift Valley fever, um, which is transmitted through infected animal fluids, as well as mosquito-borne. Okay, so a general review of symptoms. Um, you can see here this, this list, fatigue, fever, muscle aches, headaches, um, and the list goes on. Uh, these, except for hemorrhage at the end, are primarily seen in, in many different uh, diseases that we see throughout the world, um, similar to malaria, yellow fever, dengue, typhoid. Um, and this makes it incredibly difficult to diagnose um, in the beginning. So generally when someone presents, um, unless there is an outbreak already of viral hemorrhagic fever, it's going to be missed 
that in fact someone is suffering from this, this uh, hemorrhagic fever. Um, most of the, uh, it's about 90% of these symptoms are shared by the uh, fevers that were listed on the page previously. Rift itself does not have diarrhea. Um, some of them don't have sore throat, but as a guide, this is what you will see for most of the viral hemorrhagic fevers. Um, hemorrhage I put at the end. The reality is that if you are sick with a viral hemorrhagic fever, you often are not presenting with bleeding um, unless you're really at the end stage of your disease. Um, it's less than 10% in the Ebola epidemic um, of 2014 in West, West Africa, less than 10% of those who presented at triage actually presented with bleeding. Um, throughout the course of their disease, about a third of those individuals were going to have bleeding during the illness. Um, but uh, it um, is not a, an immediate um, symptom. We're just gonna pause for a second while I switch my headphones. Sorry about that. Are we better now? Great. <laughs> all right, hopefully you all can hear me now. Okay, so general treatment for viral hemorrhagic fever is really focused on supportive care. Um, so this means uh, provision of fluids, so whether they're oral fluids or through IV, um, supportive nutrition, so making sure that they're getting really high calorie dense meals um, and able to eat, encouraging individuals who are sick to eat, provision of electrolytes, so this would again either be oral or through IV, um, and then antipyretics for fever, um, which generally does happen with these uh, viruses. And then there's treatment for other potential co-infections. So, um, you know, a lot of times in this region, you might get Ebola and malaria at the same time, or Lassa and malaria, um, or due to the course of the disease for or, um, the viral hemorrhagic fever, maybe you have um, an intestinal infection that occurs as well. Um, so you would be treating them as well. Um, Ribavirin is a specific treatment that's been used for CCHF as well as for loss of fever. Um, this can be given orally or through IV, um, and it has shown success in kind of turning the tide for those individuals who have um, gone to the hospital and who are not doing well. Um, generally, if you do present to the hospital, if, if uh, resources allow, you will be started on ribavirin for LASA. Unfortunately, it's fairly expensive, particularly in the IV form. Um, and is uh, I was recently told, at least for, for our World Medical Mission Hospital that's in Togo, that they have to request from the WHO in order to get this drug. Um, it's not generally readily available. Um, then we have vaccines. Uh, unfortunately, these are not currently a part of normal treatment or preventative treatment for most of the viral hemorrhagic fevers. Um, CCHF is, it, there is a vaccine available, but it's not available for worldwide use at this point. Um, then there's dengue. In 2016, there was um, a vaccine created, but also not available for universal use. And then Ebola, there is a promising study occurring throughout West Africa right now. It's called the Prevail Study. Um, and it has been shown to uh, create a potential for immune response um, as a result of giving this vaccine. So um, it is yet to be closed yet, and, and we don't have the, the findings as of yet, but it does seem promising. And then for loss of fever, unfortunately, there are no vaccines that have been created as of yet. And then Rift Valley fever, there is one, um, but it's not currently licensed for human use, so it's not being used. Um, immunotherapies, um, I'm sure you all, if you've heard about Kent Brantley's case, um, the doctor, the SP doctor who got Ebola in 2014, um, the uh, staff on the ground actually gave him ZMAP, which was an experimental drug at the time and still is. Um, it's uh, ZMAP is antibodies that have been, or a collection of antibodies that have been designed to increase the chances of patient survival for those who have Ebola. Um, it was given to Dr. Brantley as well as Nancy Reichold. And those that I've talked to um, who administered this to them say that they're, they're convinced it was the turning point for their disease process. Um, but there are still studies that are occurring to really um, solidify whether this is uh, a therapy that can be regularly used for Ebola or for other viral hemorrhagic fevers. Um, so let's look at case fatality rates. 
Uh, case fatality rate is just a fancy way to say um, we're, we're going to count the number of individuals or the percentage of ind individuals who died out of an overall epidemic or, or outbreak. Um, so for CCHF, um, in general, it's about 40% of individuals who do die um, as a result of this disease. So it's rather high. Then we have dengue. Um, that's actually less than 1%. Obviously, for the more severe cases of dengue, it's a little, little increased. Um, then we have Ebola. The average for this is 50%. Um, for loss of fever, the overall is about 1%. But then for those who present to the hospital, generally the ones who are more sick, their case fatality rate or rate of death is about 15%. Um, then we have Marburg, which is an average of 50% as well, similar to Ebola. They're actually very similar viruses. And then Rift Valley fever is less than 1%. Um, so if you notice, Ebola and Marburg have the highest case fatality rates. Um, during the epidemic in West Africa, we saw ranges from anywhere 20% to 80%, um, sometimes 90%, depending on the age group. Um, for a case fatality rate during that epidemic. Um, this was really dependent on a, a few factors, um, well, several, but in particular, um, how soon individuals were brought to the treatment unit after onset of symptoms. So if you came in maybe two days after uh, you started symptoms, you potentially would have a higher chance of survival. Um, whereas if you waited until 10 days into symptoms where you're already dehydrated, you're already behind on your nutrition, um, your likelihood of surviving would be less. Um, now, I, I did just read a, a study that actually didn't see a significant link to that. Um, however, um, there's still some more information that they're digging around because it, it just makes sense that if you're really sick when you come in, it's going to be harder to bring you back um, at the end. And then also a factor in this was how overcrowded Ebola treatment centers were. Um, so if you, unfortunately, if you got the disease maybe in August or September when there was really high caseloads in Liberia, in the main city of Monrovia, you were going to be in an Ebola treatment center that was overwhelmed. Um, so I had colleagues who, you know, they worked, um, they actually worked uh, at one of the centers in MS, or one of the MSF centers in Monrovia, and, you know, just explained that there were literally patients on the floor, two in each bed, and every time a patient died, um, a new one would be put there. Um, and the reality is that if you're giving supportive care, you really can't give the level of care you want when you're overwhelmed as a clinician with you know, over hundreds of individuals in that center. It's very similar to something like cholera as well, where you know, you're really dependent on those basic items such as um, nutrition and fluids. And if you can't, as a provider, get to them, get to all of them and spend the time you want, um, fortunately, overcrowding really does um, decrease your chances of survival as a patient. Um, and then also the age of the patient is important as well. Um, so this would be for any of these viruses, but in particular for Ebola, um, there have been studies that have looked back at this most recent outbreak and, and shown that for under two years of age, it's about a 76% case fatality rate. Um, you know, this is uh, under five is always um, a really uh, difficult age range to make sure they stay healthy and stay alive in developing nations. But in particular for Ebola, the under two, um, the under two age group, it was really hit. Um, and then even two to five, their overall case fatality, fatality rate was around 50%. Um, so, you know, this, just practically speaking, I saw this, um, the, the reality being that, you know, a little two-year-old who's sick is going to be much more difficult to make them eat, to make them drink um, in a treatment center or even in a hospital if, if you're providing care for them there than even an adult. You know, we see this with many different types of diseases, not just a viral hemorrhagic fever. All right, and so I would be remiss um, to talk about Ebola and not mention Dr. Kent Brantley, as I already did. Um, but I wanted to just point out, um, number one, I love this picture because he is working together with the national staff member. That he's in Monrovia. This is before um, the weight of the virus hit Elwa, um, or sorry, the, the compound there in Monrovia. Um, and, you know, they're working together. It looks like to me they're creating the solution that you need to wash your hands. Um, and I... And particularly grateful, um, I'm not necessarily grateful that he got sick, but the reality is that because Dr. Brantley got sick, um, I, as well as many others, decided to respond to Ebola. Um, it was actually watching the news of him um, on the TV, uh, the fact that he was sick, that he had been flown to Emory, and then seeing um, Ken Isaacs get on 
uh, to C-SPAN and testify to Congress about the weight of this disease. Um, it was literally that day that I made some phone calls and then a month later went to Liberia um, to respond to this epidemic. And I know that there are many who, as a result of Kent getting sick and others, um, decided to respond as well. And hopefully that was a part of, of kind of changing the tide of this of that epidemic. Okay, so let's talk a little specifically about Ebola virus disease. Um, there have been several outbreaks, but the first was recorded in Zaire. Um, now known as DRC in 1976. Um, it, most likely there have been hundreds of outbreaks, we just don't know about them. Um, they generally happen or used to happen in very remote areas of jungle. Um, DRC has a lot of those places as do others in um, the central of Africa. But um, more recently, these have kind of broken out into to the wider world. Um, there's several subtypes of Ebola. So there's the Ebola, Sudan, Budabugyo, pronounce that correctly, sorry, Zaire, Rustin, and then Typhar subtypes. And even within these subtypes, there's many strains and mutations that occur um, for the Ebola outbreak that started in 2014. I think I heard a figure there's you know, over 22 mutations, um, but uh, it, it can change even within that subtype. Um, so as I last checked, Today, um, at least on the CDC website, there's about 30 outbreaks that we've recorded in total. Um, there is a current outbreak um, going on right now in DRC. This was just announced yesterday. Um, so very apropos for us to be doing this lecture now. Um, there's a total of 17 deaths so far. Um, the great thing uh, about this in ways is that DRC has seen many outbreaks and are actually very skilled in responding and containing. Um, primarily focusing on isolation of these outbreaks so they don't spread. Um, so while our prayers are to that region, um, it is it has been seen that they generally can respond and um, kind of close down the outbreak pretty quickly. Um, and then there is the outbreak uh, that started in 2014 and predominantly affected West Africa. Um, we all know about this one. Again, this is, um, SP was very much involved in this outbreak. Um, individuals got sick, it became had worldwide attention. The total number of cases was around 28,652. I say around um, because the reality is there were several, if not hundreds, and, and probably close to a thousand or so, um, if not more, cases that would never have been tracked. Um, so when the virus first started or the outbreak first started, um, no one really knew what was going on, um, and there wasn't an active surveillance network and there or a contact tracing network. Um, and as a result, um, especially being on the ground and having seen how these cases were, were counted, um, it's generally assumed that there are many more um, that we don't exactly know about. And then total deaths as well, estimated to be around 11,325. The last case for this outbreak was recorded in Guinea um, in April of 2016. And thankfully, um, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia have all been in trouble with three. Okay, and loss of fever. I want to mention this because um, it there is a current outbreak going on now in Nigeria. Um, and again, the purpose of this lecture being to prepare you for those epidemics or those infectious diseases that you might see in the field. Um, you know, even if you're based at a missions hospital, uh, you might see this not even going out on a dart. Um, so loss of fever, there's an estimated about 100,000 to 300,000 cases per year. Uh, with 5,000 deaths, again, estimated um, as a result of there not being a strong surveillance network in many of the countries um, where this uh, predominantly takes place, but also because many individuals aren't actually that sick um, from loss of fever and uh, will get better on their own. And so they don't present to any healthcare facility, and as a result, they wouldn't be tracked or traced. Um, however, about 10 to 16 percent of persons, um, or sorry, yeah, 10 percent, 10 to 16% of, of persons who are admitted to hospitals are thought to have loss of fever, um, just given the overall um, spread of it. It is seasonal on a, on a general basis. Um, it, it peaks during dry season, mostly because you know, the excrement of the rat can, can dry and then um, become particularized, and as well as just kind of float and, and be on surfaces and on food. Um, but then during rainy season, rains come, um, kind of tampers everything down, and there's less likely to be disease transmission. Um, again, it's primarily spread through the urine and feces, as well as the meat of the multi-mammate rat. Um, 
we might not think about this, but meat, um, meat of rats, as well as even bats, which can harbor Ebola, is a main source of protein for um, a lot of parts of the world. And so um, this can be difficult to contain as a result. Um, so the current outbreak uh, is in Nigeria right now. Um, as of Jan or it started in January of this year, and there's been around 2,000 cases, around 100 deaths that have been confirmed. Um, because of the start of breeding season, however, it has started to decline in the last two months. Um, there was also some patients who were in Liberia as well. Again, it's endemic to the region, but they were seeing a small spike in these cases. And then in Togo, um, I know just from speaking to some of our colleagues who have worked in the Northern Hospital um, in Togo that's uh, associated with World Med, um, they've actually had to shift a lot of their care over towards taking um, care of patients with loss of fever. All right, so now we are going to transition to talking about personal protective equipment, PPE. Um, see in this photo, this is actually from Liberia. You can see the little chapel sign in the back. Um, this is where SP started their Ebola care. I think this might be Kelly Sites. Um, I will ask her later, but it looks like her. Um, and they, whoever is there, is actually wearing a full set of PPE. So this is the highest level of PPE that you could wear. You notice none of her skin is showing. Um, everything is covered, and then there's an individual on the other side who is spraying her. Um, it looks like they're doffing, or she's about to come out and take off all of her, all of her pieces of personal protective equipment. What I want you to get from this slide is the idea of dirty versus clean. Um, this is a basic health prevention um, or health protection principle. Um, the idea that we want to keep dirty, dirty, and we want to keep clean, clean. Um, so you can see she is dirty in the white. Um, she, even though you can't see the Ebola particles, she certainly, if she had just taken care of patients, has Ebola in some way, shape, or form all over her, whether it be through vomit, um, you know, excrement, or blood in taking care of those patients. Um, she is dirty. And then we have someone on the other side, um, you know, if you can imagine an invisible wall that won't be crossed, they are clean while they are wearing what we call light PPE. That, um, that small gown and some gloves, they are on kind of what we can call the safe side or the clean side. Um, so for any kind of disease that we encounter, this is extremely important. Um, whether you are providing care to a patient, whether you are the wash sprayer who's, who's standing there and spraying somebody as they come out, or even if you're taking out the trash within some kind of facility, whether it's Ebola or you know, a much lower virulent um, hemorrhagic fever or not, um, it's so important to understand these principles of clean versus dirty. Okay, so let's review infection prevention and control principles. Um, the main purpose of, of IPC, or infection prevention and control, is to present, prevent sorry, exposure to contaminated fluids. Again, that would be um, blood, urine, uh, vomit, um, feces, any of those things, or even sometimes saliva, spit, whatever it might be um, that is coming from a, an infected individual. Um, for VHF, or uh, in particular for Ebola or loss of fever, contact and droplet are, are the modes of transmission. What that simply means is that if you were to touch one of those fluids, you could potentially be exposed and get the, the virus. Or if somebody were to sneeze and release droplets or particulates into the air, um, they might fall on you, they might get in your mouth, whatever it might be, and they could contaminate you that way. So for loss of fever, or sorry, for VHF um, prevention, um, for loss of fever in particular, as well as Ebola virus, um, it's really important that you do not eat or handle contaminated animal meat. As I mentioned before, that seems maybe foreign to some of us more Western-based individuals, but um, you know, we go to the, the store and we pick up our meat in a cellophane packet. Um, but for those who are living in other areas where they go to an open-air market, meat's being cut right there, or they're hunting and gathering it themselves, it's a little harder to maintain that sterility or, or even to just maintain being clean. Um, and when you're eating things such as rats or even bats for your protein source, um, making sure it's contaminated or not is a little bit more difficult. Um, so it's really important that during an outbreak, um, appropriate community messaging is happening so that individuals and communities know that there is an outbreak and to stay away from certain contaminants. Um, it's also really important to create a barrier between you and a contaminated uh, or contaminated human body fluids. 
Um, uh, even better to avoid it altogether. But if you are taking care of someone, um, in fact, you're going to need to touch them. Um, that's the that's the great thing about PPE is that it allows you to give care and touch someone. Um, but you still just need to be very cognizant that that barrier will not save you. You also have to know how to put it on appropriately and take it off. And we'll go over that soon. And then loss of fever in particular, you want to make sure that your food is stored in containers um, to prevent rats running over it. Uh, you want to keep a clean house as much as possible, which you know, is, is potentially difficult to do if you have a dirt floor, um, and then rodent control. So um, some basic ways would be to get a cat. Um, this is actually encouraged by WHO is to have a cat in your house uh, if you are in an endemic area for loss of fever. Um, and if we can get to it today, um, I will briefly go over just the control side of, of this principle um, and talking about isolation of infected persons as well as appropriate isolation and disposal of contaminated fluid. Okay, very basic. Um, and I would say probably the most important component of prevention and keeping yourself safe is hand hygiene. Um, it literally is life-saving. <laughs> I know that um, your mother probably told you to wash your hands all the time. If you're a healthcare provider, you get reminded 100 times a day. Um, but this is extremely basic, and it is one of the most essential things that we can all do to keep ourselves from even just getting the flu. Um, so using soap and water um, in a lot of viral hemorrhagic fevers, we use 0.05% chlorine solution to wash your hands, or even an alcohol-based hand rub is also effective long as your hands are not visibly soiled. And then for cleaning of infected surfaces, you want to use, soap, you can use soap and water. Um, and then for Ebola, what we use is 0.5% chlorine solution. So a much stronger solution than that which you would use to wash your hands or body parts. Um, just as important as washing your hands is also understanding roots of transmission of um, a potential infection to yourself. Um, so we have three main ways that that can happen, and that's um, an entry, way or entry point of the eyes, the nose, as well as the mouth. Um, it's really hard not to touch any of these parts of your face throughout the day. Um, I think we all do this probably about 10 times every hour if we're not paying attention. Um, but the reality is if your hands are not clean and then you touch any of these orifices, um, most likely they will get infected in some way. Um, and in a, the case of Ebola or viral hemorrhagic fever, which is potentially deadly, um, you're literally uh, kind of introducing your, your death through those, through those areas. So um, just as important as washing your hands is also being cognizant of what you're touching. Um, along this line would be making sure that you're keeping, if you have a cut somewhere, that you're also not allowing that to be a source of infection as well. Okay, so some principles of personal protective equipment. Um, the main one is to avoid contact between patient body fluids as well uh, and the staff eyes, nose, mouth, or non intact skin. So that would be a cut. Um, primary point of prevention is to prevent contamination from the splashing of body fluids, such as vomit, diarrhea, urine, or blood. So again, that's why we wear the suit, um, is to protect us from that splashing. Um, and then secondary prevention would be um, any contamination from staff accidentally touching their eyes, nose, mouth, or non intact skin. Um, so that's why you'll see in a few minutes why we wear a face mask, why there's a hood, why there are goggles um, if you're going in to take care of a patient, in particular with Ebola. And then um, the third prevention principle is um, preventing contamination of staff from contaminating themselves while I'm dressing from PPE and later touching any of these orifices, the eyes, nose, or mouth. Um, so we'll go over that as well. Okay, some components of basic PPE. Um, so there's a spectrum of, of how to protect yourself. Um, it goes from the most basic, which would just be wearing gloves, to the highest point of PPE, which we'll go over in a minute, which um, would be fully covering yourself to protect you from a disease. Um, so, but basic PPE generally has these main components to it. Um, you're wearing some sort of head covering, some sort of eye shield. Uh, it could be a face mask or actually goggles. Um, you have a head covering, gloves, hopefully you're wearing scrubs or something underneath, as well as a light gown. Um, ideally, you'd have boots, but if unavailable, you could put on shoe covers, and then you're going to have a mask as well. Um, really important, actually extremely important, to any sort of personal protective gear is how you take it off. So it's one thing to wear it and protect yourself from the contaminant. 
It's another thing to take it off without contaminating yourself while you're taking it off. Um, so as you see in this first step here, um, the individual has taken off her light gown and she's actually, or he is rolling it into it itself so that all the dirty parts are on the inside and all the clean parts are facing out to her on the outside. Um, that way you won't be touching the dirty parts and then potentially getting yourself dirty afterwards. Um, important next step is performing hand hygiene, so always washing your hands. And then you're going to remove whatever is on your head, whether it be a goggles or a face shield and a mask, and then always performing hand hygiene afterwards. Um, you'll see in everything that we do uh, when you take off your PPE, hand hygiene is this step that comes after every small point in the process. Okay, and then this is high level PPE. Um, so this is a picture from, I think it's from our FOIA um, SP Ebola Treatment Center. And you'll see that these individuals who have on the suits, this is, they're fully covered. Um, you know, they're all still putting on their goggles, but other than that, everything is covered. There's no skin showing or there won't be once the goggles are on. Um, they've got, you know, this, this suit, they've got an apron over it, they have um, a mask over their, their nose and their mouth. They have a hood covering and they even have goggles that they'll put on later and many layers of um, gloves. And here are some other examples of high level PPE. Um, so there is a kind of a, not a rivalry, but there are some differences there. What we just saw was the MSF style of PPE. Um, they were the ones who they're very well known for their ability to respond um, and accurately and, and very well manage uh, Ebola, and so they've written several guidelines on it, um, and the kind of PP that we just saw was was theirs, um, or at least the components of it. And then on the left-hand side here, you see what's also termed as high-level PPE, but it, you see some skin that's been exposed. Um, so if you notice, they're not actually wearing a full suit. Instead, they have um, a gown on, and then they have these face she or yeah face shields that are covering their face. Um, one guy looks like he has a bonnet on, so he does have some of his neck covered. Um, but this was a kind of PPE that was used um, throughout West Africa, as well as the other kind, um, in many Ebola treatment centers. Um, so I personally would never walk into an Ebola treatment center with my skin exposed. However, there were many different centers that did this um, and had success in keeping their staff safe. Um, and that really is a testament to if you adhere to infection prevention and control principles um, and basic principles of hand hygiene, and, and dirty versus clean, you can keep yourself safe um, depending even on the types of PPE you wear. And then on this um, right-hand side, this is um, actually another picture from the Monrovia ETU that we had in the chapel, um, the, the Elwood Chapel. Um, you can see it looks a little different than the slide we saw previously. Um, however, they are the same protocol, the same guidelines for how to put on the PPE. The reality is these, in fact, are guidelines, they're principles. Um, you might have different pieces of equipment available to you, in particular in a large outbreak when resources are scarce um, and some equipment might not be uh, available or it's already been used up. You take the principles of covering yourself in an effective way um, and you piece it together. And so that's, you know, this looks a little different than what we saw previously, but it's the same idea. All right, so now we're gonna get into donning. Um, this is just a fancy way of saying we're going to put on our PPE. Um, so we'll go through this quickly so we can get to a doffing video, but um, donning, first step, put on your scrubs, put on some rubber boots, your first pair of gloves, as well as your second pair, if that's a part of the guidelines. Often that second pair is a little higher, it's a surgical glove um, that will go over your wrist. And then put some anti-fog on your goggles. What we used was soap, essentially, uh, to help our goggles not fog up. And then you're going to put on your big suit. Um, so this looks like a Tyvek suit. Um, they're, they don't breathe very well, um, which means that you get hot pretty quickly, especially in 100 degree weather with 100% humidity in West Africa. Um, and then you're going to put uh, the edges of your gloves inside of the suit and secure the sleeve loops or create your own if they do not have. Next is your mask. You want an N95 mask to ensure that you're not going to be um, getting any of those uh, droplets through your mask. Um, you wanna make sure that your chin is covered, that it fits well around your face, 
Um, and it's really best to make sure you try out your mask before even going into the treatment center or, or it, it to provide care to a patient. Um, primarily because depending on the, the size and shape of your face, one might work and one might not. I remember using um, one particular mask that after being in the Ebola treatment center for about an hour, it had become saturated with sweat because yes, it is hot there. Um, and it essentially suction cup to my mouth such that I couldn't breathe uh, because it was wet. Um, and so I had, uh, I rushed to get out and, and still had to go through all the steps to take off my PPE, but um, I, I wish I had tried it out before I had gone in um, because once you're inside, you can't just take it off. And then, um, Depending on your type of hood, you might need to tear a space into your hood so that your mask can stick out, um, put on the hood, adjust the N95, and then the tie the hood in place. Generally, for these types of hoods, there's about three um, places where you tie at the back of the head, um, the back of the neck, and then under your arms. And then last step, you put on your waterproof apron and then well-fitting goggles. And, oh, sorry. This is the last step. Um, depending on your area of specialty, you will put, if you're clinical, you'll probably put on a third pair of latex gloves, hopefully surgical so that they're a little higher, then you'll tape them um, to your gown. And then if you are a wash uh, in personnel, you know, whether you're going into spray or take out trash or whatever it might be, you would put on some heavy duty gloves. They look like kitchen gloves and you would tape those as well. All right, um, and so now we are going to view a doffing video. Um, I will talk you through it a little bit. This was in our ETU in FOIA, um, and I'll talk you through the steps and go from there. Um, so what we're seeing here is uh, an individual who has on all of his PPE. He has just come out of the Ebola Treatment Center, um, and he is doffing, so he's taking off all of his items. You will see there's two individuals standing outside who are watching and monitoring him. One will be spraying him and one should be talking him through the process. The reality is that if you've been in there for the last two or three hours, you're hot, you're dehydrated, um, you're probably not thinking too clearly. I experienced this several times and you need somebody to talk you through it and make sure that you're going through the right steps. So his first step was to take off his gloves um, he then went and washed his hands. He still has another pair of gloves underneath of him. And now the sprayers um, are spraying him with 0.5% chlorine um, to hopefully A, get off any of the contaminant that might be there or any of the fluids from taking care of a patient um, and B, to sanitize him essentially. So now he is going, or he has untied his apron um, and is putting his apron, which is a heavy, durable plastic, into 0.5% chlorine. That will be used again. It'll actually, he's going to at some point take it out, dump it in another bucket, and then it will be taken out and hung up to dry in the sun. Um, generally about 24 hours in the sun will kill just about anything. Um, so those aprons will be used yet again. Um, he's washed his hands, and now they're spraying him again, um, spraying in the places where he will be touching next and where um, the apron was covering previously. So the next step is he's going to take off his goggles. They also will be reused, so he's put them in the 0.5% chlorine. Washing his hands, always important. Ideally, you want, to, you want to wash your hands for 30 seconds. That has not happened, <laughs> um, but that is encouraged. Um, and now he is breaking the ties from the back, um, and he'll break the one underneath as well. I think he actually forgets in this case for a second. Um, yep, there he goes. And he's going to just slide that hood off, hopefully without touching oh, those straps on his head. Um, so again, concept of dirty versus clean as much as possible. You really, in these kinds of situations, um, and if you're healthcare providers, you've done this in, in your hospitals as well, um, you don't want what's dirty touching you, which hopefully is clean. Um, so really anything that's going to come off of you, you want to try and keep that inside layer, which is clean, hypothetically. Um, you want to keep that touching your body versus any of the outside. So he's washed his hands again. Now he's going on to take off his suit. Um, 
this is a little tricky because there's a tab up at the top that you have to pull down. There's a sticky, there's a sticky slide underneath of there. So he's going to need to undo that stickiness. And then he's going to need to find the zipper without looking down and unzip his suit. So having done this several times, it, it looks, it's a lot harder than it might look, um, especially because you're not looking at what you're doing. You don't necessarily have a mirror, although sometimes, depending on the ETU, you did. But that's why the individuals on the outside are really important um, and are supposed to help you talk you through what's going on. So right now he is doing what I call the PPE dance. He is shimmying off his Ebola suit. Um, you'll notice he's touching the inside and pulling down from the inside, um, not touching the outside. And then he's going to use his feet to pull it off and then step on it. Unfortunately, he's then also going in a minute to pick up what he just stepped on. That is not ideal. Um, but you see there, they just sprayed it for him. Um, and so he is going to hopefully gingerly pick up that suit and put it in the trash. That will not be reused. And now he's washing his hands with the 0.5% chlorine. Um, he's going to get sprayed again. I believe, oh, this is the part where they take out the apron that's been sitting there for at least 30 minutes um, from the last person who was there, and they're putting it on the outside or the clean area so that someone, um, I believe the Watson's going to come, and she's going to take it now and take it to go clean it one more time and then hang it up in the sun. And you'll notice in the background, um, another individual just came to the back of this doffing area. Um, you can't hear her talking to him, but she does guide him as well. And a really important principle to any kind of PPE or, or um, you know, taking care of someone in a high, highly controlled environment is having a buddy system. Um, it's when you put on your PPE, you have somebody check you when you go through. We would always send in two people at a time just to watch each other's back, make sure that nothing happens, um, or to call, oh, hey, your goggles just slipped. You need to go out. Um, and so the individual in the background actually does at some point remind him, hey, you skip this step, um, make sure you do this. So just to get back to what the PPE guy is doing, he has now had his shoes fully sprayed. Um, he carefully walked out and stepped onto um, a pad that had 0.5% chlorine solution on it. Um, and now he's going to go and actually take off his gloves and wash his hands in 0.05% chlorine solution um, and then go about his day in the ETU. Go back to the slides now. All right, so um, I think we might end here, um, but I wanted to take an opportunity to just talk about the patient. Um, you know, the entire reason why we um, even think about PPE or you know want to learn more about viral hemorrhagic fevers is so that we can care for a patient. Um, and I love this picture because it, it just kind of shows that um, uh, how alone sometimes um, you might feel as a healthcare provider um, in this kind of situation, but again, how important it is um, for that little child's life that you were there. Um, and so, you know, it is difficult um, in, you know, putting on all of these things, trying to take care of a, a person, trying to connect with them when all they can see is your eyes, um, trying to care for them when you have three pairs of gloves on, when you're sweating, um, when your goggles are, are all fogged up. Um, it's difficult, and yet we come back to why we do it, which is to care for these individuals, um, you know, hopefully to bring the light of Christ to them. Um, we, have that, we have that responsibility as well as the gift to be able to do that, you know, with an organization such as Samaritan's Purse. Um, and it, it is, it truly is a gift. Um, I am so thankful that we had the, the basics of, of health prevention and, and control. Um, we had PPE so that we could go in and take care of patients. Otherwise, um, they'd be left to fend for themselves. Um, I remember, you know, the first time that I actually picked up a child in my suit and, and had cringed a little bit thinking that, oh my goodness, I was going to get Ebola literally all over me. And yet they just snuggled up there um, and hung out for a little bit. And that was probably the only time that day that they got held. Um, and so that's really important. Um, and, you know, as we look back on the outbreak that happened in West Africa, um, it can be overwhelming at times. Um, and then, you know, to see in the news today that we have the DRC or an outbreak in the DRC, um, it can be overwhelming. And yet um, 
we we do know how how to respond. We do know how to prevent. Um, and and hopefully with some of the basics that we've learned today, um, you all will feel a little bit more prepared if in fact you were ever called upon to respond to an epidemic or you know whether it's a bull or loss of fever or not. Um, you know you would have the principles with which to be able to respond and then think. Now I'm gonna hand it over if anybody has any questions. Very uh, happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Megan. I think your expertise shines through, also your compassion and your desire to honor the Lord and all that you do. And I'm glad that I get to work with you. As we wait for a few questions to come in, I have a couple of my own. So let's say I've watched this presentation and within a few weeks from now, I have the opportunity to go um, somewhere where there's an outbreak and respond. What might I expect in an ideal response setting um, in terms of the opportunity to practice donning and doffing before I actually have to commit myself to patient care? Oh, uh, well, I, it would be my hope that if you responded with Samaritan first, that we would make sure that you, in fact, did get to, to practice first. Um, what we did for our training in Liberia was we actually did three days worth of um, didactic training. So a lot of theory and presentations, but also um, practical experience in a mock ETU. Um, so that would be, you know, a safe environment. Um, we called it the cold zone versus the hot zone where there's Ebola. Um, but we would set up, hopefully, um, you know, a cold zone where you could practice donning, doffing, going through, providing patient care to obviously fake patients, but still understanding what that flow is like. Um, something I didn't mention was how important it is to make sure that you keep your flow going towards um, from clean to dirty and you never backtrack. Um, that includes even you don't want to walk backwards when you're in an Ebola treatment center. Um, because you don't know what you're going to run into, um, but it also is just the principle of always moving forward in what you're doing. Um, so you're always going from clean to dirty and then doing the prop the appropriate doffing uh, to then become clean again. Um, but yes, uh, before going, um, we would always want to make sure that our staff are prepared. You know, unfortunately um, for the epidemic in West Africa, our staff on the ground didn't have the time to prepare beforehand. Um, it hit them where they lived. And so um, they did an amazing job of, of learning quickly of, you know, MSF was there as well and helped to teach um, our staff on how to put on, how to take off, how to set up in an Ebola treatment center um, and uh, to really be able to manage it effectively. Um, but props to them for doing it without going through a training course beforehand. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Alice Lee. First of all, he says this was an excellent presentation. His question, if you have a caregiver in full PPE, collapse from dehydration inside a con sorry, containment unit, how can the PPE be removed by others wearing PPE without contaminating the caregiver? Well, that is a great question. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. And it's one I'm laughing right now because it is the one question that we never fully answered um, at our ETU. And, and thankfully, we never had to fully take care of it. Um, but it was the one that worried us all because the reality is it's not only um, a, a potential you know, source of infection to that individual who is has now passed out. Um, and can't take off their PPE themselves, but it also could contaminate you as you know another um, healthcare provider uh, who's helping them. So um, the answer to that question is I, I don't have a perfect answer. Um, you know, essentially you you would take the person out of the hot environment, try and get them somewhere cool, see if you could they might be able to wake up themselves um, without having to doff them yourself. But um, then you would need to probably have one other person come in. Um, either, you know, prop that individual up on a chair or have someone hold them um, and do the doffing for them. Ideally, you both would be sprayed all over in chlorine before you even touch this individual um, so to make sure that you're not then contaminating them. Um, it would not be a perfect procedure. And if I was that person who had passed out, I would probably wash myself in 0.5% chlorine to make sure that um, any contaminants were removed. Um, 
But uh, yeah, you would have to treat it very gingerly. Um, it, there would not be a perfect process, but you would follow each step um, as well as you can. Um, and obviously hoping, hoping that we hadn't suffered some kind of cardiac event or anything that required immediate life-saving care. Um, that would, we would need to assess that as well. So um, tricky situation uh, that would hopefully you would be able to figure out on the ground. Any other questions? Um, if I may, I'd like to reply to that. I think it just reinforces the need to know your limits mm -hmm. and also to do everything you can to remain hydrated and rehydrate before going into that. And then also um, the body system that you mentioned earlier where we can watch out for how one of them is doing. Uh, so we do have a question here. Hi. Um, so unfortunately, we were not able to get to the last slides. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but there are two questions on the post test that do go over some of that information. Um, so the one of the questions asks, um, what is the main purpose of a viral hemorrhagic fever treatment center? Um, is it to provide treatment to patients who have a confirmed infection? Um, the reality is that for our treatment centers, really the main point of, of a treatment center is in fact to provide isolation um, to for that individual and for the community. Um, so it's isolating the person with Ebola or whatever it might be in that area so that does not um, expand to any outlying areas or so that does not continue to grow. Um, so the answer would be that no, it, the primary reason for a viral hemorrhagic fever treatment center is not actually to provide treatment to the patients. Um, that's actually really hard as a healthcare provider to hear and even to say. Um, the reality is that um, while we very much wanted to um, care for patients while they were there and we wanted to provide care that would increase their chances of surviving, um, really the point was to isolate them so that it wouldn't spread to a much larger number of people. Um, it's, it's the hard fact about a, a virus such as this. Um, so that's question four. And then the last question, um, when entering a treatment ward or center, you should only go from, um, so this is thinking of, we can use clean and dirty, or you can use the terms low to high risk. So you always want to go from low risk, which would be the clean area, then to high risk, which would be the really dirty or contaminated area. Um, and you never want to go backwards. Hopefully that answers those questions. Um, anything else? I think we have time for one more question. And this one comes from Julie and Jess oh, Thiessen. And they thank you for your presentation. Um, Antipyretics for VHF without signs of bleeding, do you recommend avoiding NSAIDs? Oh, that is a great question. Um, we did, in my Ebola treatment center, avoid the use of NSAIDs. We use paracetamol, otherwise known as Tylenol. Um, I have seen studies that have shown that you can use either. Um, I would need to do a little bit more fact uh, digging for that one to look at some of, you know, potentially MSF or some of the other Ebola treatment centers um, to see what they came or the the um, kind of uh, sorry the consensus that they came to. Um, but I I have seen a few where that was used in treatment centers and it it did not increase. Um, the risk of hemorrhagic bleeding. Uh, so the idea being that if you were to give an NSAID, it could potentially increase bleeding in a patient who might already be prone to bleeding due to this viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, again, my experience is particular to Ebola, where we did use paracetamol instead of an NSAID. Um, for others, I'm not sure. I would have to go look. So I can let you know on that one. Thank you so much, Megan, and I want to thank um, the participants who were able to attend today to our live presentation. And I just heard that earlier that several hundred people will actually watch this afterwards. So that's exciting and encouraging. And I also want to remind you that CME credit is available for this session. The form and instructions are in your email. And we will be sending a follow-up email with the link to this recording, as well as any um, additional resources that Megan mentioned or would have mentioned had she had more time. And if you're not already on our email list, you can join the forum at health.samaritanspurse.org and be the first to know about upcoming events. And speaking of which, 
Our next webinar will be Wednesday, June 13th with Dr. Mike Chupp, who um, I believe serves in Kenya at Tenwick Hospital. He will present Operating Outside Your Surgical Training Comfort Zone. Oh, that sounds great. We hope to see you then. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.